Alright, yeah, welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and M20 has finally hit the Magic Arena client after some very, very long and annoying downtime. So, I haven't actually managed to make a deck for you guys today, but I thought I would instead go for a pack opening video, because I can probably do that a little bit quicker. It is 2am in the uh, morning, so... Yeah, let's get right to it. Before I do though, why don't we uh, give you guys some codes that you can actually enter into Magic Arena to get some free stuff. So the Mastery System is now implemented, so you can actually get a uh, free two levels if you type Level Up into the store page up at the top right there. If you do that, I've already done it of course, you'll get two levels which includes a pack for free to play players and I think an additional pack if you purchase the Mastery Tree, which I've done but that's only because I expect to be doing daily stuff. I would recommend if you're free to play, or at least thinking about doing this, uh, but not necessarily one of the people that plays the game every single day, I would actually wait until you get to the end of this tree uh, before you actually decide to make a purchase, because everything up until that point, if you do actually um, buy the bottom tree at any point, you will earn all the rewards up until that point. So there's really uh, no reason technically to actually buy this bottom bit until the very last moment anyway so uh, something to keep in mind but other than that there is another uh, code you can actually implement which is also uh, play uh, m20 which looks like that and that'll give you free uh, three free m20 packs for you guys to open again i've already done it but play m20 i did it in all capitals and it worked for me but i think you can basically do it in any kind of casing but just to be sure do all capitals because that worked for me but yeah without further ado let's open some packs shall we and I'm gonna be doing it a little bit differently than I usually do normally I open the packs one at a time but because it's two o'clock in the morning and I wanted to get a video out for you guys I'm gonna open them ten at a time and we're just gonna talk about the rares and the mythics going into the set and hopefully I can give you guys some ideas on what kind of decks you want to build going forward maybe some ideas that you maybe haven't think of, thought of synergies that kind of thing that's the idea behind these pack opening videos for the most part um, but also I'd recommend if you're going to be doing something like this opening lots of packs and you are somebody who puts money into the game I would actually go into your collection as well and spend all of your common and uncommon wild cards the way that I have and the reason for that is that commons and uncommons don't actually have duplicate protection which means if I open them as part of the pack they actually go towards vault progress so by using all of my common and uncommon wild cards I increase my odds of getting vault progress which is just more rares and mythic wild cards which everybody needs of course uh, but that's only if you're kind of a paid player or something like that uh, I'd recommend putting those commons and uncommons into uh, cards that you might actually use just in case you'll of course once you've opened up your packs get plenty of uncommons and commons to place in areas that you might be lacking as well so without further ado let's get into open some packs shall we let's open our first 10 what do we have mystic forge oh boy and we got lots of wild cards as well mystic forge four mana artifact you may look at the top card of your library at any time and you may cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card or a colorless non-land card. You can pay one life to exile the top card of your library. So this is basically um, a experimental frenzy with less restrictions on the uh, lack of being able to play out of your hand. So you can still play all the cards in your hand, but uh, the top card of your library is way more restrictive. Uh, if you hit lands, you can't play them. If you hit colored cards, you can't play them. So that pay one life to exile the top card is going to be really important. Uh, if you're going to run this, you want to have basically a 90% uh, build of colorless, I would say. You're probably running only a few cards, like uh, big uh, promo Tezzeret from... What was he from? Uh, he wasn't War of the Spark, was he? No. Um, the six-mana Tezzeret, anyway, the one that has the creepy hand, which is plus two. Uh, that was probably one of the few colored cards you should play. Maybe a... Uh, Sahili or two as well uh, but other than that though try to restrict yourself purely to colorless if you're going to run this otherwise you do have a chance of even whiffing you can also use things like traveler's amulet as well in place of lands uh, that is a one mana artifact that actually pays one to pull a basic out of your deck so you thin your deck of lands which 
uh, decreases the odds of this whiffing as well as getting the colors that you need which for the most part you'll probably just be needing uh, a specific one color and then the rest be colorless cards anyway so it's really useful for that kind of thing and you can cut down on your land count that way but Mystic Forge probably not too playable maybe if they get Kaladesh back in Historic we might see a fun little combo deck with that but it's probably about it. Repeated Reverberation, 4 mana for an instant whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell or activate a loyalty ability this turn, copy that spell or ability twice, you may choose new targets for the copies. So the loyalty abilities, I'm not entirely sure on the uh, broken application for it there to be honest, but the way I would use re uh, repeated reverberation is probably something like a thousand year storm deck, being able to copy this repeated. Um, if you repeat a repeated reverberation then you'll get copies for each copy of your repeated reverberation and then you can do something like copy shock nine million times. Uh, you could also put this as well if you guys are a fan of the bells and lock combo you can put that in the deck as well. Uh, being four mana means that bells and lock will roll right over it so it's another card that allows you to dig right to the very bottom of your deck so very useful there. Icon of Ancestry is our new Lord effect from M20. Basically, it fills the gap for any creature type that does not currently have a Lord. Uh, three mana, uh, creature of the chosen type, get plus one, plus one, and then you can pay three and tap it to look at the top three cards of your library. Reveal a creature card of the chosen type from among them, put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So basically, it's card draw, but also a Lord effect. Um, I would say if you're... Um, if your creature type that you've chosen already has a Lord effect, thinking things like uh, vampires or anything like that, you probably don't want Icon of Ancestry. But if you're for some reason wanting to have like a Lord effect for dragons, then I could certainly see you playing it in this one. Being uh, that it has card advantage is also very nice. But something like Radiant Destiny, if you're playing a white creature based um, creature type deck then you want to be running Radiant Destiny I think over this because the Vigilance is very nice but it's going to be one of those where you just kind of pick and choose it's based on the weaknesses of your deck uh, if you need to block a lot then obviously you want something like Radiant Destiny but if you need the card advantage then Icon is just going to be a little bit better. We have Steel Overseer, a 2 mana 1-1, one, one. put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each artifact creature you control. This thing is bonkers with the 3 mana Sahili. 3 mana Sahili being the one where it says if you cast a non-creature spell, create a servo, uh, an artifact servo at that. So you're going to be able to storm out a fair few servos here and the Steel Overseer being able to put a counter on each artifact, including itself, means that Sahili's tokens will get progressively bigger and bigger. This is basically a must-answer threat in the right kind of deck, so really happy to see Steel Overseer at the moment. Again, if Kaladesh comes back to Historic, then this will sure as hell see a lot of play, uh, since it sure as hell sees a lot of play in Modern as well. Chandra Acolyte of Flame. Now, in the streamer event, we ended up playing a fair bit of this card, mostly in Chandra Tribal as a fun little piece. Sorry about that. I'm next to a train station. Uh, so Chandra, 3 mana, 4 loyalty. Yeah, we played this in the uh, Chandra tribal list, which was really funny, but being able to put a counter on each red planeswalker you control for 0 is really nice, so you can pump up your other Chandras. Uh, but you can also use this on things like Sarkhan as well, who could maybe get another dragon out of it, the newest Sarkhan. Um, a new Chandra as well, the, the 4 mana Chandra is very nice to get that pumped up as well, get that close to 7 so you can ultimate. Uh, but there's just a lot of red planeswalkers right now that this goes really well with. The zero is also really nice as well. Two one one red elemental creature tokens. They gain haste, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. Things like Omnath cares about when elementals enter the battlefield is also the new reef, uh, the Simic three drop one one. Um, that also cares about elementals entering. So this is actually two triggers on an elemental entering kind of effect. So it's really solid for that. But being able to just swing for two and do some decent damage is pretty sweet. If you're doing Chandra Tribal as well, one of the Chandras actually does pump up elementals as well, which is pretty cool. And Chandra's, um, Chandra's Reverberator, or something like that, Regulator, uh, also has a pay one, so you can double the effects here. So you could have actually a zero here to get up to four one one red elemental creature tokens, which is pretty sweet. Dracoseth, more of flames. Four and triple red for a 7-7 seven, seven with flying legendary creature. When it enter when it attacks, sorry, it deals four damage to any target, three damage to each of up to two other targets. So if you attack the face, you're gonna be basically pushing eleven damage 
uh, to your opponent's face with this card. It's really good in kind of reanimator strategies. Uh, we tried a red-black one, which was a little bit inconsistent for us, but we did also see a few Jund lists that was doing it quite uh, well. Uh, we do now have a four-mana uh, reanimator spell, so you can get something like a mix rat. Rick's Mardi Reveler uh, to discard this into the yard on turn two, and then turn four you sacrifice that Reveler, bring back Dracoseth, and he's ready to go. So he's one of the best reanimator targets in the format at the moment, uh, second only to probably Villis, although I guess it's uh, matchup dependent as to which one is actually currently better at the time. But yeah, being able to put 11 damage towards your opponent's face, that's very hard to do since it's blocking, uh, very hard to evade, sorry, because it'll be there won't be any blockers. You can also point three damage over to two creatures and wipe the board. That should basically kill three creatures or even some planeswalkers as well. So this thing is an absolute monster and a threat that must be answered the moment it comes out. Leyline of Abundance, a four mana enchantment. If it is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. And if you tap a creature for mana, add an additional green. So this basically has mana docks in mind. So Elf Ball is like the uh, the go-to deck to be running Leyline of Abundance. I would probably put these in as a four of for Elf Ball, since a lot of the elves actually do have that tap for mana ability. So a Land of War Elves is going to be tapping for two mana on turn one, which is pretty sweet. Well, you get to use it on turn two, but you get the point. And then the six and two green there to put a counter on each creature control is exactly what Elf Ball wants to be doing. I want to be storming out like crazy. There is a new elemental as well. We saw one combo during the streamer event, which was really cool. And I aim to actually replicate it at some point in the near future. Um, it basically it had an elemental with pay five green mana to untap a land. And they used that on uh, the growing rights of Itlamok, I think it was called. The uh, the green enchantment that actually flips if you've got five creatures and then becomes a Gaia's Cradle. Uh, they were paying the... Uh, they were tapping that land which was generating six mana and paying the five to untap it. So basically they generated infinite mana and Leyline of Abundance was one of the ways that they got there really quickly. So uh, that was another really fun way and they basically got infinite mana. Leyline gave them infinite damage and they swung for lethal. So it's a deck that I actually plan to try out at some point in the future. Really fun to play around with as well. And I expect this to see a little bit of fringe play here and there, but yeah, it's it's very restrictive as to the places where you can play it. Leyline of the Void, solid uh, sideboard tech, I would say. Four mana for an enchantment. Again, if it enters your opening hand, you may begin with it on the battlefield. And if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So this is the best graveyard hate in mono black and this is seeing a lot of modern play so it might see a fair bit of standard play it's basically going to be banning good graveyard decks from actually existing in the format unless they can deal with this enchantment really easily because if you're going with your exploration plan for example and you're trying to put uh, cards in the yard using the explore they're going to be immediately uh, exiled it's not until like turn three that you're probably going to have a decent removal spell for this ley line and that's going to be a tempo swing that you don't really want to be doing so it's going to be pretty solid if you are running it um, in the sideboard at least for best of three otherwise we have graft Div Graf digger's cage which is for everybody else so it's going to be a mix and match between those two as to whether you'll want to do either one and then finally we've got voracious hydra Double green and X for a 0-1 with Trample. When it enters the battlefield, it enters with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the amount you want to pay. So if we paid 3 mana, we would enter with uh, 1 extra counter, so it would be a 1-2. However, when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose one of the modes there. We actually get to either double the number of 1-1 counters on Voracious Hydra, or Voracious Hydra fights a creature you don't control. So we basically enter with the counters, and then we get to choose one of those. We can either double it, so if we were paying 3, we would actually get a 2-3, which is a 2-3 for 3 is not too bad. You will probably want to pay for 4 minimum, so you'd be getting a pretty decent result there. And then also having the ability to fight creatures as well is very nice. The trample is absolutely huge on this thing as well, being that it has um, the full potential to be a monstrous threat that goes right through. Hydra Tribal, we saw a little bit of. It probably won't be too big in the format, but you definitely will be seeing it from time to time, and it looks like a ton of fun as well. All right, let's move on to the next 10 pack, shall we? All right. 
some more wild cards and Temple of Silence and we've also got Temple of Malady and Temple of Epiphany so a very temple hand right here. So these ones are the Scry lands, it's the newest lands to take over, the lands that will be rotating um, in the fall, uh, I think it's around September-ish if I remember correctly. Um, but the lands that are rotating out are going to be replaced by these temples So I imagine by the next set we're going to get the other half of the temple cycle as well So uh, we've got I think it's about five at the moment. We got the Ozov one the Golgari one the uh, is it one? I think we also we have the Boros one What's the other one? I'm not quite sure. I think we've got the other one though. There's one more, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, they're pretty decent. Um, at the moment, I wouldn't really replace too many things uh, with the temples just because shocks and checks are, for the most part, better. But there are a few situations where I would run these cards, specifically in decks like Yarok. Yarok being a 5 mana Soul Tie legendary creature, 3 5 death touch with lifelink. If a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So actually, Temple of Silence is a scry one twice if you're running Yarok. So running stuff like Temple of Malady in a Yarok deck, I would absolutely suggest, but not going too crazy. You don't want the full playset of these, probably two of max uh, in your deck. Just It's nice to have them on te uh, turn one. Uh, but if your deck is quite slow and doesn't really get off to the start until maybe turns 2 or turn 3, then having tap plans is not the worst thing in the world. But if you're running like Evo um, Blanowar Elves, you definitely don't want Scrylands in your deck because that tempo swing is not something you're looking for. But control decks that are going slow, combo decks that are trying to find their pieces, that's definitely where I would see these temples. But if you're on a budget and you just so happen to have them, then it's better than not having uh, the Scry, of course. Cavalier of Flame. 2 and 3 red for a 6-5, so decently started but hard to cast. Uh, 1 and red, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0 until the end of the turn and gain haste, which is pretty sweet. So you can maybe build up a big board and uh, stick this thing into play, but it's probably going to be hard to do that with that mana cost. You're probably going to be tapping out most of your mana to make that happen. So this thing probably has to be in play before your big monstrous threats come into play. Uh, but when it ends the battlefield, you get to discard any more cards and draw that many cards. So you get to filter your hand, which is pretty sweet. And when it dies, it deals X damage to each opponent and each player they control, where X uh, is the total number of land cards in your graveyard. I think as a player, I meant Planeswalker. But yeah, nice board wipe on that one. You can really set this one up if you have the way of discarding those lands like evolving wilds is now in this format as well so you can crack evolving wilds and then when this dies it's going to deal at least one i wouldn't rely on this too much in that sense but just having this ability to wipe on a cavalier if you can kill it yourself or uh, maybe your opponent's forced to block it eventually and then you wipe to your advantage that could be quite cool but i don't know some of these effects seem to contradict each other you know you want a board state that uh, gets that pump spell which means you're going wide which means you don't really want to um, actually, no, it's each opponent and each planeswalker, so it actually doesn't hit creatures, so that's okay then. Um, but yeah, just being able to wipe um, is okay on walkers, I guess, so that's fine. Flood of Tears, 6 mana sorcery, return all non-land permanents to their owner's hand, so it's River's Rebuke, and it's going to be our replacement. And if you return 4 or more non-token permanents you control this way, you may put a permanent card onto your hand onto the battlefield. So this is 6 mana Omniscience. Omniscience being the, I think it's ten, it's 7 mana? 8 mana? Something like that. A really expensive enchantment that says you get to play cards from your hand for free. So if you Flood of Tears, bouncing 4 permanents, put Omniscience into play, then you get to put all of those permanents back into play for free. So you're not really losing any value there. And Omniscience just lets you uh, combo through your deck. That's probably going to be the only place that you see this going, but uh, I might end up seeing this in the occasional like Simic list that just wants that kind of value, but to be honest, I don't think that I'm going to see this outside of Omniscience combo list, so if you see this being played, know that Omniscience is not far behind and you need to play around that. Leyline of Combustion, the the red Leyline, so it enters the battlefield if it's in your opening hand, and whenever you or at least a one permanent you control becomes the target for a spell or ability an opponent controls, Leyline of Combustion deals two damage to that player. So basically it punishes your opponent for trying to target your creatures. So things that come to mind is your opponent trying to moment of craving your creatures to gain a life, uh, gain advantage over you while also removing a creature. This basically negates that. 
However, we've got Tybalt at the moment as well, which is a 3-mana walker that prevents life gain anyway, so I'm not entirely sure if you'd want Ley um, Leyline or Tybalt over one another, but I guess it's all for testing, you know. Some people are playing Chandra over Experimental Frenzy these days, and it's just nice even split. It ends up uh, switching as time goes by, so you might see these probably in the sideboard for Mono Red from time to time. I'm not sure that it's main deckable, though, but you never know. And Dungeon Geists, 4 mana 3-3, three, three. when it ends the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control dun Dungeon Geists. So, this is not a bad card if you're running it in a blue tempo list, but it is kind of expensive for that. Um, you want to really have this as your finisher, I guess, if you're running it in a blue tempo flyer list, which is the only place I'd expect to see it. So uh, that tap probably wants to be hitting a really big creature that could block your finishing blow, that kind of thing. If you could double that trigger, then this is definitely worth the value, because uh, right now we have the uh, the pirate siren uh, that kind of does the same thing, except for it has flash, but it also does some tapping if you have pirates in play. So that's kind of a restriction on your deck, and therefore this dungeon guys might be better than that card. But there are a fair few flying pirates at the moment that I don't think it's too much of a downside all the same. So yeah, uh, moving on. More Ley Lines, more Yarraks, more Yarraks. Yarrak is pretty great. We played him in a Sultai Blink deck. Never actually mentioned this and he did really well. Uh, I run him in, we had end, ended up going with an elemental theme as well. So we had the, uh, the, the Risen Reef which triggers off of elementals entering. Again, Yarrak entering would trigger them twice, which was pretty disgusting. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's just... its not much to say about him, really. He's a doubler. You probably want him in your main. If you're running a Muldrotha list, a one-of, definitely, of Yarrak is pretty much uh, a given, because you want um, you want your Muldrotha deck to be very enter, ba enter the battlefield. Uh, focus. You want all of that value, you know, making sure you're getting it as they're entering, that kind of stuff. Golosh, Tylus Pilgrim, 3-5 five for 5. When it ends the battlefield, search your library for a land card, point onto battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle your library. I don't think this card is playable all that much. There is a little bit of combo potential in that uh, the 5 mana down at the bottom there. Exile the top 3 cards of your library. You may play them this turn without paying the mana cost. Uh, you could actually hit some decent cards like Omniscience. Uh, but honestly, the Flood of Tears that we mentioned earlier is just a better way to do that. If you're in a weird 5 color nonsense deck though, then I guess by all means run this card. It fixes your mana. It's a 3-5 so it's hard to kill. But other than that, it doesn't really have an evasion card. I think it's basically just um, a commander card, to be honest, that's printed for M20. Atemsis, all seeing three and double blue for a four five flying. We managed to win with this one on the streamer event, which was interesting. Um, we ended up doing them on a blue list, which wasn't quite optimized for it, but we kind of got lucky and ended up having our win con here. It is one of the alternative win con kind of cards as well. So whenever it deals damage to an opponent, you may reveal your hand. If cards with at least six different convenient mana costs are revealed this way, that player loses the game. So it's really big deck building restriction. You're not putting this in a normal deck. This deck, it, this card is a build around only kind of card. It does have the ability to uh, draw two and discard a card for three mana. So it's bad um, charter course, essentially. So it's really awkward. Uh, I don't feel like it's one of the strongest alternative wing con kind of cards in the format, but to each his own, you know, you can get split cards in here, which um, are nice and cheap, but also count as a higher converted mana cost. So like uh, Discovery Dispersal, as an example, is a two mana play for the most part, but it's actually a seven converted mana cost card, which doesn't actually collide with many other cards in the format right now. So it's easy enough to set up those six cards, but getting in the damage is going to be difficult. You could use a, a wand to do it as well. Equip this with a wand and then you don't have to attack, that kind of thing. But honestly, it's about as janky as alternative win cons get. Night Pack Ambusher. Four mana for a 4-4 four four with flash. Other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one, plus one. And at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast the spell this turn, create a 2-2 two -two green wolf creature token. Wolves got a little bit of value in this newest set as well as the previous War of the Spark kind of block era. Uh, there's a few wolves, you know, we've got the Tulsimirs, we've got the Arlins, things like that. This is our wolf lord to see them out. 
Um, it's okay, this card. Uh, we ended up getting some flash value in, the end step thing, getting extra 2-2s. Two Basically, if we had an Arlen out in play, we were incentivized to just not play anything, just activate Arlen, get a 3-3. Three, three. End step, we got another 3-3 three, three from the Night Back Ambusher, while also pumping up all of our werewolves, making Tulsimir's fight a little bit better. Uh, it was quite fun. It's never going to be anywhere near... Uh, tier 1 or tier 2 but as a tier 3 kitchen table bit of fun stuff it was a lot of fun actually to mess around with this one. Graf Digger's Cage as I mentioned earlier is going to be the premium graveyard hate for the format because it also hates on Experimental Frenzy as well. Uh, one mana artifact, creature cards in graveyards and libraries can't enter from the battlefield which basically means uh, your opponent can't cast creatures off of the top of the deck with Experimental Frenzy. Also says players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries as well, so we can't use Jumpstart cards while Graph Digger's Cage is in play. It's not too relevant. You don't really want to bring this in if your opponent's running like uh, Chemist's Insight or anything like that. It's not really worth it all that much, uh, but as a little bit of a side value piece, it's not too bad all the same. Finally, we got Shifting Ceratops, 4 mana for 5-4, for cannot be countered, and Protection from Blue. So uh, there's a few split cards now, right now in the Esper Hero list um, that could hit this card. Um, I'm thinking Tyrant Scorn, things like that. It now has Protection from Blue, which means it can't be the target of uh, spells or abilities of that chosen color. And creatures that would try to deal damage to it are basically not going to be able to do that. So uh, blue cards cannot absolutely touch this card at all. It also has green to give the choice of reach, trample or haste as well so pretty nice. Five mana for a 5-4 with haste is pretty sweet against a control list as well that can't be countered. Nice way of closing out the game. Even Teferi cannot bounce it as well which is pretty sweet. So there's a lot going for this card. Is it playable? I'm not entirely sure but if you're running a dinosaur themed deck then this is definitely going to go in there, at least in the sideboard, against those control matchups that might run sweepers and things like that. It's going to be the one downside of this card, because it obviously does not survive Kaya's Wrath, but that's probably one of the few answers that they have to this card. So it's almost a Carnage Tyrant in that sense, where it must be answered by a board wipe. Temple of Silence, and we got the brand new Chandra Awakened Inferno. Six mana for six loyalty. Planeswalker, this spell cannot be countered, so it's a nice big red finisher against the control decks, and it is a finisher at that because the plus two says each opponent gets an emblem with, at the beginning of your upkeep, this emblem deals one damage to you. So you could bring this in against the Nexus lists that are trying to take extra turns because whenever they take an extra turn, they're going to take one damage and there's nothing they can do about it because it's an emblem, so it's not going to be able to be removed. It basically puts the game on a clock, which Nexus does not want to be on, as well as control decks as well, which are trying to slow the game until they're ready to finish off. So it's really going to warp how control decks need to finish their games if this does indeed see a little bit of play. Uh, but yes, as I mentioned, big red decks, um, even red decks that are splashing another colour, are probably going to be running uh, Chandra. I don't expect this to be played in the red deck wins kind of strategies, though. Six mana is way too much for that kind of matchup. Uh, but honestly, this is a pretty sweet card. Also, the minus three uh, gets a three damage to each non-elemental creature. It's going to be pretty sweet as long as elementals doesn't take off. And the streamer event, it was all the rage. Basically every other game seemed to be Elemental Tribal, so we're going to have to see whether or not that's actually the case. Um, like Nissa's lands that she creates are Elemental, so it won't do anything against uh, Green Nissa uh, either, so it got a bit of problems there. But for the most part, this is a really nice sweeper. The minus X, deal X damage to target creature or planeswalker, and if a permanent would be dealt, uh, damage this way would die, exile it instead. So you get to wipe out Planeswalkers. Again, you'll be taking up to 8 loyalty. So being able to minus any Planeswalker that follows Chandra is not going to live very long if she sticks around on the battlefield. And the tick up is exactly where you want to go most of the time anyway. So yeah, putting on, on a nice little clock as well as being able to take care of Planeswalkers and a board wipe. This thing is a powerhouse of a card if you can actually build a deck to run it. Knight of the Ebon Legion, 1 mana, 1, 2, it has a activated ability of 3 mana, says it gets plus 3, plus 3, and gains death touch until the end of the turn, so it becomes a 4, 5, 
which is a pretty solid thing for a one drop vampire, which vampires do not have very many good one drops. They've got legions landing and that's about it. So Knight of the Ebon Legion is going to be pretty sweet. It says at the beginning of your end step, if a player lost four or more life this turn, which this card alone is capable of doing on its activated ability there, you get to put a 1-1 counter on the Knight of Ebon Legion, which will eventually lead to the point where it will be able to deal damage without even being able to activate itself. If you're running vampires or you're running knights, this is going to be a really good uh, card to run. Honestly, it is on the creature types alone that this card absolutely shines, but the activated ability is kind of like the Growth Chamber Guardian kind of situation. You might want to be firing this off on turn 3, but honestly, um, in except for the case of the Growth Chamber Guardian because it's capable of replacing itself, this one isn't doing that, so you're going to have to be a little bit more careful on the activation, but if you don't have a 3 mana play, that's definitely what you want to be doing with this card. It is absolutely solid, and I would run it in any of those tribal lists listed here. Rotting Regisaur. Hate this card. I absolutely hate it. I tried it out, and we didn't have much luck with it. 3 mana for a 7-6. Solid body, of course. And at the beginning of your upkeep, discard a card. There is a fair bit that you can do with the Rotting Regisaur. You can get a turn 4 Vilis um, or a Dracoseth with this card, so you play this on turn 3, on turn 4 you discard your Dracoseth or your Vilis, and then you play, I think it's called uh, Blood for Bones, something like that, there's a 4 mana, sacrifice a creature, return a creature, and reanimate a creature. So you could use Rotting Regisaur to get that turn 4 play, but honestly I find that um, Mix Ra Rick's Marty is just much better to do it, because you're not actually... Uh, stripping your hand apart the longer this stays in play. It is a must answer, sort of, but the fact that it doesn't have any kind of trample, flying, or anything like that means that your opponent can block with 1 1s while your hand slowly degrades into absolutely nothing. This card is garbage. I hate it. It has some jank value, but it just does not work for me. Embodiment of Agonies. 3 mana for a 0 0 flying death touch. It enters the battlefield with a 1 1 counter on it for each different mana cost among non-land cards in your graveyard. As an example, two and a black is different to one and two black. So it's really easy to actually get this thing uh, to be a lot bigger than it looks. You think to yourself, oh, you've got to play different mana costs, but no, the fact that it actually counts um, the different color uh, combinations rather than the mana cost specifically is really nice on this thing. You're going to need something like a Stitcher Supplier and a bit of luck to make sure that this thing comes down on turn 3 as a decent body, but honestly a 3-3 three, three for 3 with flying and death touch isn't the worst thing in the world, it's going to need to be blocked eventually, and then you're going to take out something nice and big with it. But yeah, uh, in a graveyard synergy deck, you'll probably want to run this card, at least as a 3 of probably. Um, there's also Kalia as well, which is caring about demons and things like that. Um, this is a nice mid-rangey card for that kind of uh, strategy as well. Dread Presence. We played a little bit of this card and I did very much appreciate it. Uh, three and a black for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever a swamp enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. You either draw a card and lose one life, or it deals two damage to any target and you gain two life. The way that we use this one was in a scape shift build, and honestly I expect to see that being the case if it does see any standard play. Uh, I think there's a Jun scape shift list going around at the moment that's running this card. Um, but yeah, being able to basically drain for two, and every time it swamp ends the battlefield, what you end up doing is scape shifting and destroying all the lands in your deck and then making lots of swamps enter at the exact same time. All you need to do is have 10 swamps enter the battlefield throughout the game and you will kill your opponent with Dread Presence. So if you can get up to like 10 mana um, or even less depending on their life total and then scape shift, replace them all with swamps, you've just got a one shot kill. So it has some combo potential, but if you're running a mono black deck, you probably want this card as well because the card advantage is very nice. And honestly, the losing one life is negligible since the uh, Dread Presence itself is capable of regaining that life for you anyway on its second ability. Leyline of Anticipation, uh, the blue Leyline, this one gives spells flash. It's going to be pretty sweet as a combo card. You get to use the finales uh, at instance, instant speed, kind of the similar way to using Expansion Explosion as an example. Uh, it's also probably going to see play if you're running a Wilderness Reclamation deck, so you can take advantage of all of that untapping on your end step um, to get some extra value. Uh, I'm probably going to be running that in a rec deck myself at some point just for a little bit of fun. Uh, it's probably only going to be janky um, when you're running this ley line, but 
Honestly, there's a lot of fun to be had from playing sorceries at instant speed, as even creatures with flash as well is very nice. And then we've got the Temple of Triumph, the Boros Land speaks for itself. Hanged Executioner, 3 mana 1-1 one, one with flying. When it ends the battlefield, you get to create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So 2 1-1 one, one flyers for 3 mana isn't too bad. This is like Lingering Souls, so it's, it's alright. But without the, the flashback that makes Lingering Souls good, you also get to pay 3 and white to exile it to exile a creature as well. Uh, outside of playing a spirit deck, I'm not sure this is going to see too much play. Uh, maybe in a flyers list as well, if you can get like a flying pump. We do now have a new bird as well as um, favorable winds as well, which would make you have two two twos for three mana, so you're automatically upping the value on this card and therefore um, getting some extra value. It's worth playing if you can have these as two twos. Um, but yeah, being reliant on another card is a little bit iffy for this one, but I think it's decent enough in a flyers list. Blue-white flyers with like Dovan to take up and get some extra value there might be quite sweet. Um, but yeah, there's a new Flying Lord now, so Hanged Executioner could see play there. We do, of course, still have a Spirit Lord as well, so we could take advantage of that. It's a 1 and a blue, I think, for a 1-3 flying that pumps up spirits. So, decent enough. Um... It's just a value card at the end of the day. I don't think it's worth the rare slot necessarily, but, you know, it is what it is. Starfield Mystic, one and a white, two, two. This gives me hope that we're going back to Nyx at some point for the enchantment love. Enchantment spells you cost, cast cost one less to cast. And whenever an enchantment you control is put into the graveyard from a battlefield, put a one, one counter on Starfield Mystic. So you can get yourselves a two mana history of banalia and when the history of banalia hits that turn three chapter and goes into the graveyard you got yourself a three three starfield mystic it's nice i don't think there's anything really you want to run starfield mystic for though other than just nice value engine um but eh, it's all right i guess if we're going back to nyx where everything's enchantment based we've got enchantment creatures some big enchantments like um uh, i don't know really big enchantments anyway, <laughs> then you want to be running this card, but until that happens, uh, probably not. Uh, it's probably just a nice little filler card for kitchen table magic. Safara Sky's Blade, 4 and 3 white for a 7-7. Seven, seven. You may pay 1 white and tap 4 untapped creatures you control with flying rather than pay this mana cost. So Convoke um, for a total of 5 mana for a 7-7 seven, seven flying lifelink that also gives other creatures you control with flying indestructible. I could see this as maybe like a two of something like this. Uh, it looks very much like it's suitable for commander play, honestly. Um, the alternative cost to cast it gets around the commander tax. That's probably where you expect to see this card a lot. But in standard, might see a little bit of play uh, in a flyers list. But other than that, not too sure. Glint Horn Buccaneer. Two, uh, sorry, two red and one for a two four with haste whenever you discard a card. Glint Horn Buccaneer deals 1 damage to each opponent. If we remember the, remember the Red Cavalier, that's got a capability of discarding as many cards as you want and redrawing, so you can get some value out of that as well, dealing 1 damage to each opponent for each card you discarded and redrew. Uh, we also have um, Gideon's Heartwarming Redemption. Uh, that also discards your hand and redraws. And we also have Neheb as well, which is capable of refueling your hand. So we have a lot of wheel effects that can actually make Glinthorn Buccaneer quite interesting. Uh, is it capable of a one-turn kill? Probably not, but it can do some severe damage if you've got two in play for sure. But yeah, it can also use the red, discard a card and draw a card. So a nice looting effect to find what you want. But you can only do that when it's attacking. So if your opponent has a decent blocker, then you're going to be in trouble. But yeah, there's a little bit of combo potential here, but not too much. Villis, Broker of Blood. Five and triple black for an 8-8 eight eight with flying, legendary creature. You may pay one and pay two life to give target creature minus one, minus one until the end of the turn. The paying two life actually triggers the extra ability, which is whenever you lose life, draw that many cards. This is basically like budget Grizzlebrand. Um, you can fuel your entire hand. You could even give your own Villis the minus one, minus one, so you could draw two cards for one mana. It's pretty solid. Again, it's our best uh, reanimator target in the format right now, next to Drekaseth, so you can get this thing out on turn four and then use its abilities on turn five, or maybe even get to draw some cards when your opponent tries to uh, attack through it. The lack of life gain, which is what made Grizzlebrand so good, uh, is not there, so 
it is it is what it is, but I think it's a pretty decent um, creature all the same. Even if you get to pay two life and draw two cards uh, before it dies, that's not going to be the worst thing in the world. And yep, that's essentially that pack. Let's go again. What do we got? Loxagon, Life Chanter. Six mana for a 4-6. When it enters the battlefield, you may have your life total become to the total toughness of creatures you control. So, uh, big booty tribal. This might see some play in something like a high alert deck, which is obviously very good on the toughness. The six mana to give the Life Chanter plus X plus X until the end of the turn, where X is your life total, is kind of relevant. It makes it a must-block answer, but at six, um, six mana cost... You're not going to be getting this down at a point where your opponent can't answer it. So it's a bit of a weird one. But being able to have your life total become a bare minimum of 6 might be relevant against uh, an aggro deck, perhaps, if you're running it for that reason. Outside of that, though, it's just janky potential, to be honest. Bishop of Wings, double white for a 1-4. Had a ton of fun with this, and you'll probably be seeing a deck running this sometime this week. Uh, two mana, one four, so really good against the burn decks. It's going to need lava coiling. It says whenever an angel enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life. And whenever an angel you control dies, uh, create a one one white spirit creature token with flying. So you run this, obviously, in angel tribal. Um, you can run it with things like resplendent angel, which is a card that I've played a lot of recently and have mentioned that I will continue to keep playing with it. So it's very much a decent uh, wildcard option if you're interested in um, crafting things that are going to be rotating, at least. Um, when Historic comes around, you get to play it again if Historic ends up being good, which at the moment is not looking so great. But gaining four life whenever an angel enters the battlefield is pretty sweet. What you can do with this card is all you have to do is gain one life with a Resplendent Angel extra, and then you've gained the 5 life for a 3-3 three, three to make a 4-4 four, four every turn. And that 4-4 four, four entering will trigger the uh, Bishop of Wings again, so you gain another 4 life. So aggro decks are going to really hate this card. Honestly, I think against the Mono Red matchups, this Bishop of Wings is going to control the game if you get it down on time and they do not answer it. So really solid option. And the bottom part also has a little bit of combo potential as well. Um, when you make the angel dying, you make a 1-1 one, one spirit creature. You can actually have uh, Divine Visitation. Is that what it's called? The 5 mana enchantment that says uh, whenever a token enters, it becomes an angel. So you can actually have the angel die, become an angel, trigger the Bishop of Wings, and you've basically not lost anything, which is really, really stupid. We never managed to pull off that side of the combo, but we did run it for a little while all the same. Leyline of Sanctity. Two and double white for an enchantment. Enters the battlefield, put it into your onto the battlefield if it's in your opening hand, of course. And you have hexproof, which means you can't be the target of burn spells in Red's case or uh, combos that maybe need your opponent to be able to target you to win things like that. Uh, expansion explosions come to mind. You can't actually get targeted by any of those abilities. So uh, leyline of sanctity, purely sideboard tech, of course. Of course, the uh, Simic was the one I was missing on the scries. Um, it's purely sideboard tech. I would never put this in my main deck unless something like um, Nykthos Shrine to Nyx comes back into play and then Devotion to White might matter. And then you've got yourself a nice Devotion package there. But other than that, pure sideboard tech. Even against the Mono Red, I'm not entirely sure if it's all that great because Mono Red is a good chunk of creatures these days and they don't care about that hexproof. But Wizards Retorts and things like that can't ever go to your face they'll only have to go to your creatures so it's iffy whether or not this will see too much play but you never know if the right combo deck gets enough traction then definitely we might see some stuff wake root elemental this is the one i was on about earlier six mana for a five five you get to pay five to untap a land you control it becomes a five five elemental creature with haste and it's still a land so you put this on your growing rights of itlamok um which should hopefully be tapping for 6 mana. You pay 5 to untap it, tap it for 6, pay 5 to untap it. You've got yourself infinite mana. You can do whatever you want with that. And as I mentioned, something like Leyline of Abundance gives you the ability to sink that mana into basically infinite damage. You can animate every single land in your deck using Wake Root Elemental at that point. So I'm going to be building a deck around this at some point in the future because it looks like a ton of fun. But yeah, that's the combo potential for this one. Other than that, maybe a green stompy list. Might just enjoy it for the value alone. Who knows? Okay. 
Kaikar wins Fury 1, and Jeskai colors for a 3-3 flyer. Whenever you cast an on-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. You get to sacrifice a spirit to add one red mana. We use this on our M20 day. We actually ended up doing a Banefire Storm list, so Kaikar in conjunction with uh, Sihili, and everybody's favorite arcane adaptation naming spirit turned absolutely every single creature into a spirit, which meant if we cast a one mana spell, we would generate two spirits, which we could then sacrifice to generate some red mana. So what we ended up doing was uh, generating a ton of spirits, sacking our entire board and bane firing our opponent for lethal. Outside of that, it's a pretty decent um, value engine if you're not trying to do some jank potential with it. Uh, just getting lots of spirits, which are very hard to block, over on your opponent by burning and things like that. You're in the right colors for non-creatures, you know, the blue and the red specifically. All you'd have to do is to splash the white and you got yourself a pretty decent non-creature package that can take good advantage of those spirits and just value your opponent out. Chandra's Regulator, uh, one and a red for a legendary artifact. Whenever you activate the loyalty ability of a Chandra Planeswalker, you may pay one. If you do, copy that ability, you may choose new targets. You can also pay one, discard a mountain or a red card and draw a card. So this is flood protection in mono red, which is pretty sweet. You can also discard extra copies of Chandra Regulator. So this is one of the few legendary permanents where it's actually not even slightly bad to run four copies of it. Uh, usually you don't want to legend rule yourself with this one, but this actually can protect itself from that while also digging to find the proper answers. Obviously you want to put this in a deck that's jam packed full of Chandra's. We put it in a deck that only had Chandra's in it. Uh, Chandra Tribal really took a turn. It was uh, it was a lot of fun, and we ended up doing some really decent damage with uh, Chandra Tribal. I think we ended up doing like six and two or something like that. All we did was shove every single Chandra in the format and anything with the word Chandra in it into a deck, and we did pretty well on the streamer event. Would you do that well in uh, normal standard? Not entirely sure. Probably not, but. It was a hell of a lot of fun anyway, and yeah, this is absolutely an auto-include in a Chandra-based deck, but it's pretty good. Lotus Field, Hexproof enters the battlefield tapped, but it enters, you have to sacrifice two lands. However, it does add three mana of any one color, so you basically uh, enter a tap land and lose two lands for three mana, so you're not actually netting anything in particular uh, by using the Lotus Field. However, if you do have a way to return lands from your graveyard to the battlefield, say um, uh, the, the Crucible of Worlds, or brought back, which is right here, you can actually get those lands right on back. So this is a really janky way of ramping, but if a land specifically matters, so like five mana Teferi gets one tap lands, then Lotus Field might be something you're interested in because Teferi gets to untap three mana. Uh, outside of that, though, I think most of the potential on this card is very janky. Uh, you're not really going to need to run it. The Hexproof is nice, so you don't get Field Ruined and really lose out on value. But, yeah, you get there's a bit of a Lotus Field brought back combo. I don't personally think it's worth the ramp. I think you could probably do anything and ramp a little bit better than that, but who am I? You know, I'm just the guy who who janks a lot, so what do I know? <laughs> but yeah, brought back two white mana for an instant speed. Return up to two target permanent cards from in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped. The one use for this that we saw was using History of Benalia. When it ultimates and goes into your graveyard, you get to brought back and return it. You can also do that on your end step if you really want to. Um, if your opponent blocked one of your creatures that wasn't a token, of course, and it went to the yard, you can bring it back with brought back. There's a fair bit of... Um, synergy here that you could do it some combo potential perhaps if you've got a creature that sacks itself then you can return it for uh, the value to use next turn things like that it's quite nice thunderkin awakener one and a red for a one two with haste when it enters or it attacks sorry choose target elemental creature card in your graveyard with toughness less than the uh, awakener's toughness return that to the battlefield tapped and attacking sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step there is a, an elemental that we saw popping up a lot with this one um, I can't remember it specifically, but when it enters, it actually generated elementals and it had one toughness, so it was able to be returned with the Thunderkin Awakener. This is kind of like the Dreadhorde Arcanist of elementals. It was pretty sweet, actually. Um, being able to return that, it was a lot of value. 
Uh, it's going to be quite difficult to do much with it unless you're pumping it kind of like the Red Hard Arcanist then you can bring back some extra stuff and you can keep doing that as well because the creature that you bring back will get sacrificed and you get to just redo it next turn if your Awakener survives. Field of the Dead is probably one of my favourite cards at the moment for the brand new set again for scapeshift purposes. It is a colourless land, enters taps, when uh, Field of the Dead or another land enters the battlefield under your control, if you control seven or more lands with different names, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. So what you want to do is scapeshift with this land either in your deck or in play. Make sure that when you scapeshift, the lands that are entering are seven different types, which does include Field of the Dead. So you only have to have six other different types of lands. So you could have a Guildgate, a Shockland, a Scryland, a Basic Land also counts. It's really easy to actually enable Field of Ruin, uh, Field of the Dead. It doesn't look easy, but it really is. But yeah, you end up scapeshifting and triggering Field of the Dead as many times as you want. Most of the time, you'll end up having enough zombies in hand in the battlefield to actually threaten lethal on your opponent on the next swing. Giving haste might be quite nice. I'm not sure how you'd end up wanting to do that though, but honestly, I feel like if you can repeat scapeshift over and over again, like the deck that we were playing uh, during the streamer event, uh, then having your board wiped from those two twos isn't actually the end of the world. Just repeat the process. Okay, our only new card here is actually drawn from dreams. Uh, four mana for a sorcery, you get to look at the top seven cards of your library and put them into your hand, the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So what we're doing here is we're sacrificing instant speed card draw for card selection instead. We get to draw two for the same amount of mana as we would normally expect, except for we get to look at seven cards, which means if we're something like a combo deck, then that's going to be really nice. The thing that comes to mind with drawn to drawn from dreams for me is uh, the amulet decks. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them right now. Uh, this is going to be a pretty solid card, a three mana look at seven cards and put them into our hand, giving us pretty decent value. Even being able to copy it with the amulet is going to be pretty sweet. And it can also go seven cards to find the amulet as well if you are missing it. So I think this is a solid card, probably a two or a three of in that kind of deck. I wouldn't push it to a four at all. The sorcery speed and the cost is just a little bit too much in my personal opinion. But uh, yeah, this seems like a brilliant copy spell for the amulet list. And finally, we have Kethis. Kethis we never actually got round to building a deck with. He's an Abzan 3-4 legend. He's basically made for Commander, to be honest. Uh, but you get to exile two legendary cards from your graveyard and until the end of the turn. Each legendary card in your graveyard says that you may play this card from your graveyard. So we can bring back Planeswalkers, legendary enchantments, legendary sorceries can be cast from the graveyard as well, which is pretty cool. Um, but for the most part, he's just kind of a big value deck. You want to put him in a deck where nearly every single thing in the deck is legendary. you got some good colors there as well. Uh, the white gives you Urza's Ruinous Blast as an example. You've also got, um, uh, what's the name of that black one as well? There's a reanimator card as well. Um, Yogmoth's Vile Offering, that's a pretty sweet one. Even um, Kamal's Druidic Vow in green. All the legendary sorceries that you actually have available for Kethis are pretty sweet there, and the cost reduction is also going to be pretty good. Um, Druidic Vow also puts them into your graveyard, so you're definitely going to be running this with Druidic Vow. Absolutely no doubt whatsoever, because the graveyard synergy actually works out for you there. But yeah, he's just a value creature. Put him in a legend deck. Cavalier of Dawn. 2 and 3 white for a 4-6 when it ends the battlefield, you get to destroy a non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token. When it dies, return an artifact or enchantment from your graveyard to your hand. So you could use this with uh, knights is a top end card. So when it enters the battlefield, you get to destroy a permanent, maybe uh, something that's in your way, maybe a planeswalker, anything of that sort. You get a 3-3 in the way, which is annoying. Uh, but maybe you'll be able to deal with that. When it dies, you can get something like History of Benalia back, or if you're running the Artifact Icon of Ancestry, you can bring that back from your graveyard to get yourself a Lord effect. So a 4-6 with Vigilance is a really decent attacker, really decent blocker, and also nice removal. It's a solid card. Yeah, run it in the black-white uh, knights lists. I think as maybe a 1 or a 2 of would be not too bad. Cavalier of Thorns. 2 and 3 green for a 5-6 with reach. Really, really good body on this one. And when it ends the battlefield, you get to reveal the top 5 cards of your library. Put a land 
from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. So ramping for one, you almost certainly do hit on those turn f on those five cards. So it's very hard for us not to do that. And when it dies, you may exile it if you do put a card from your graveyard on top of your library. It's probably one of the weaker Cavaliers, but honestly, it saw a fair bit of play and it did pretty decently all the same. Uh, being at that mana cost and ramping is a bit pointless because that's kind of the mana cost that you want to be ramping to, but it's okay. Uh, Elemental is pretty big on this card as well. Uh, that creature type actually matters in some cases. You could run this in like an Omnath list or something like that. Uh, maybe the graveyard matters as well. You could take advantage of that. Gargos Vicious Watcher. Six mana for an 8 7 with Vigilance. Says Hydra spells you cast cost four less to cast. So those green and X Hydras that are running around at the moment, they're basically a one mana 4 4 with Gargos in play. And whenever a creature you control becomes a target of a spell, which you could target yourself if you really wanted to, so a fight spell like Rabbit Bite as an example. Uh, Gargos Vicious Watcher fights up to one target creature you don't control. Mostly you want this for the cost reduction, but an 8-7 that gets to fight every turn, double fight at that as well if you're using something like Rabid Bite, is going to be really decent with this card. Um, I don't think it's going to be tier 1 at all, but if you're running a Hydra deck, then you definitely want a Gargos or two in the list just to take advantage of that, as well as some fight spells would not go amiss. 8-7 with Vigilance is absolutely super for a 6 mana creature. But yeah, that's essentially the entire 90 packs. I hope you guys have enjoyed this one. We've ended up getting not as many Mythics as I'd hoped actually, but plenty of rares all the same. Hope you guys enjoyed this pack opening. I'll be back later on in the week with some more Magic Arena. I might have to take a day off though because my voice is actually... Uh, getting a bit destroyed after the 10 or so hours we were playing the streamer event and this really quite long uh, pack opening video anyway so if I don't come back on the next day that'll be why I've probably been on the verge of losing my voice but I hope you guys enjoyed this video if you did make sure to hit that like button lets me know that you want to see this kind of content again in the future as well as hitting the bell icon to get notifications when videos go live in the future I hope you've all enjoyed and I will see you all in the arena take care guys